can we do to get girls to believe they can be physicists? I've heard this sentence a few times over my career, and every time I hear it, I think, yes, what can we do to get girls to believe they can be physicists? But then the longer I've been in my career in science communication, the more desperate the sentence has started to sound to me. What can we do to get girls to believe they can be physicists? Because we need more women and girls in STEM. At the moment, less than 23% of people at AS level studying physics are girls. Less than 23%. And out of all of science and technology, less than 30% of researchers are women. Out of all of science and technology, less than 30% are women. So yeah, you can understand why I might be feeling a bit desperate thinking, what can we do to get girls to believe they can be physicists? But now, I hear the sentence, and it sounds, it sounds different to me. It sounds, it sounds wrong. It sounds more like we're putting the weight of the problems of having less women in STEM on the shoulders of young girls. It also sounds like we're telling girls that they don't understand. We say, what can we do to get girls to believe they can be physicists? Because clearly we're telling them all the time and they're not understanding. So what's the problem with girls? Maybe it's not actually a problem with girls, it's actually how we treat them. Or more precisely, how we treat them differently than we treat boys. From the moment you're born, from the moment your sex is identified, the world treats girls and boys differently. Girls are in dresses, boys are in trousers. Girls get easy bake ovens and dolls to play with, and boys are given Legos and construction sets. When you go to the toy shop, it's not difficult to tell the difference between girl toys and boy toys. There's a pink aisle and there's a blue aisle. The most recent example of this toy differentiation I've seen was a chemistry set. The girls' version was called Pink Chemistry, that famous branch of chemistry, pink. And the boys' set was called Gross Explosions. But you might be thinking, this is what kids like. This is what they want to play with. Girls like those things and boys like those things. So let me tell you about an experiment done where adult volunteers were asked to play with a baby. They either played with baby Edward or baby Sophia. The adults had lots of different kinds of toys, boy toys, girl toys, to play with. And every adult that played with baby Sophia chose the toys that are stereotypically for girls. They chose dolls and they chose soft, cuddly toys. The toys that are associated with empathy. And all the adults that played with baby Edward chose the stereotypically boy toys. They chose puzzles and they chose blocks. And in interviews afterward, all of the adults were adamant that they chose those toys because that's what the children wanted. Edward wanted to play with the blocks. Sophia wanted to play with the dolls. And it's interesting to note that the boys' toys, the blocks and the puzzles, are toys that are associated with spatial awareness. Now the interesting thing here is that Edward was actually a baby girl dressed up to be a baby boy, and Sophia was actually a baby boy. So their, gen their clothes had been swapped. Now when the adults heard this, they were a bit embarrassed because they thought, they assumed that they were such open-minded people. But they'd convinced themselves that this is what the children wanted to play with. These are the toys the babies chose themselves. And we know from evidence that if you play with spatial awareness games and toys, like those that were pushed on the baby boy, that babies' brains change physically within just three months. So it's probably no surprise that men dominate career fields where spatial awareness is prized. So maybe when we're assuming gender differences from such a young age, we're actually creating those gender differences, and then we reinforce them with stereotypes. So as a society, we say things like, 
boys will be boys, reinforcing the idea that boys are rough and tumble, and we say, that's not very ladylike. Reinforcing the gender stereotype that girls are nice and polite. We tell boys they look clever, while girls look like princesses. And as a society, we say, you throw like a girl as an insult, because we can't think of anything worse than being like a girl. This is what we call policing gender. We've all been gender police at some point, and unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle. So from the moment that your sex is identified, the appropriate gender stereotypes are applied to you, whether you're a boy or a girl, and then because children are sponges, they soak up everything they see around them, everything the adults are doing, whether consciously or unconsciously, their behavior around children. And then children behave in a gendered way. Girls act like girls, and boys start to act like boys. And then society sees this gendered behavior, and society reinforces its stereotypes, and it starts all over again. This is gender policing. And the gender police, the harmful stereotypes they create and perpetuate, have lasting consequences for our society. The problem is that our society treats men and women differently, and women are not seen as equals to men. Here in the UK, the gender pay gap is such that women earn 86 pence per every one pound that a man earns. This effectively means that if you plot it on a year, January to December, women start working for free when compared to men at November 10th until the end of the year. And if we look at the highest paying jobs, men are the ones that are dominating in these fields. So if I take one airline as an example, the average pilot earns 92,000 pounds a year. Those pilots, 96% of them are men. 96% of those pilots are earning 92,000 pounds a year and they're men. Cabin crew, on the other hand, earn on average 24,000 pounds a year. And it might not be surprising to hear that cabin crew, on average, are 69% women, earning a lower wage. Now these have real world effects. They have real world consequences. One in three women worldwide experiences sexual violence. And these are terrible and frightening consequences of a society which treats men and women differently and not equally. But there are less insidious examples which mark out the inequality just as clearly. So it might surprise you or might not surprise you to know that tampons and sanitary towels, which are exclusively used by women, are taxed at 5%. This is because they're considered a luxury item. Now, I don't know how many of you ladies have ever called it a luxury item, but I definitely haven't. Things that are considered essential, on the other hand, essential items, have no tax. So things that are considered essential are newspapers, helicopters, Jaffa cakes. And interestingly enough, incontinence pads are not considered the same as sanitary towels. Incontinence pads are considered essential, therefore they are not taxed. Presumably this is because men might need to use them. Now, if you can take out your UK driving license and have a look at where your name is. If your driver's license says Miss, Mrs, or Ms, would you please raise your hand? Nice and high? Okay, so from where I'm standing, that looks like um, it's all, all women with their hands up. Thank you, you can put your hands down now. Now, if your license says, Mr., would you please raise your hand? No, no misters in the room? If your driver's license has no title, would you please raise your hand? Nice and high so we can see them. And that looks like it's all men with their hands up. Thank you. You can put your hands down, gentlemen. 
The default for the driving license of men here in the UK is to have no title. Ladies, your default is to indicate your marital status, Miss, Mrs, or Ms. Those aren't examples of a society where women are treated equally as men. But science is different, I hear you crying. Science is a meritocracy. If your science is good, you will advance. Your science is the only thing that matters. And boy, I wish that was true. However, if you are a medical student, 78% of the faces you will see in your textbooks will be male faces, 78% of them. And in 2015, a study found that men were reluctant to see the evidence of gender bias in STEM. And that reluctance was even more pronounced when those men were on the faculty. So let me just say that again. Men were hesitant to see that there was a problem of gender bias in STEM, and that hesitancy was even greater the more status the man had. They didn't see that there was a problem. But one in five women working in STEM in the United States experiences sexual harassment. And that looks like a problem to me. I'll give you one more example from science. This one comes from the Hubble Space Telescope. Each year, they take applications from researchers across the world to apply for time with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's very competitive and it's assessed by a committee, and it can really make or break a researcher's career to get time with Hubble. But historically, women-led proposals have been accepted at far fewer rates than their male colleagues. So if we look at 2017 numbers, you can see that 13% of applications that were accepted were by women, compared to 24% of applications by men that were accepted. That's a fairly large difference between the two. So the Hubble committee realized they needed, they needed some help, so they called in a diversity expert. And that expert came in and watched the committee discuss the science and the proposals. But what she was surprised to find is that the committee spent more time talking about the people who were proposing the science than they did the science. They talked about where the researcher came from, their institution, who their teams were, and what science they had done previously. Very little about the actual science in the application. So her recommendation was to make the proposals anonymous, to take out the information, just to make it anonymous. And in 2018, that was the first year the proposals were made anonymous, we see that 8.7% of women-led proposals were accepted, compared with 8% of applications by men getting rid of the disparity, when the only thing the committee had to discuss was the merit of the science in those proposals, the disparity between men and women-led proposals disappeared. Our unconscious bias is preventing women from advancing in STEM. Sadly, we live in a patriarchal society where the default is white men. And our scientific community doesn't sit outside of that. Our institutions do not sit outside of that. They are a product of it. The lack of women and girls in STEM is a symptom of the lack of women and girls in society. The, if we fix the systems in society that perpetuate harmful gender stereotypes, if we fix the systems in society which are preventing women from achieving equal status to men, if we can fix these symptoms in society, STEM will follow. The problem isn't that girls can't believe they can be physicists. The problem is that society doesn't believe that girls can be physicists. And we as a society need to change so that we can see girls being physicists or mathematicians or engineers or scientists. If you want to build a better future, Treat women and girls with the respect they deserve. If you want to build a better future, build a society that is equal for women and for men.
and an equal society. Now that's how you get girls to believe they can be physicists. Thank you.